the yeah. biggest question of this interview, Sam, what are we going to do if it all breaks and we have to go back to meeting face to face? If it all breaks, yep. you know, that's no more internet. You know, some hypothetical. <laughs> thing. You know, I said earlier a hypothetical about what happens if we didn't have it. You know, ultimately with hypotheticals, they're just hypotheticals. You can't really yes. say one way or the other. I had on that particular one, all I can say is we figure it out. Okay. We figure it out because before the telephone, we did it. Okay. So we figured That's it right. out. Right. You know, so I like that response. Yeah. I, was just yeah. Thinking, I don't know if the fellow, you know, like we would figure it out for, for, I, I believe the telephone. So up until 1900, we were fine. Okay. There's no reports of, uh, yeah. you know, mass suicide or anything. So in other words, for millions of years up until 1900, we were able to do that. Everything broke because there was nothing, you know, and yeah. that's that's about around that time, 1915, 20, the telephone was created. So, yeah, yeah, we'd be fine. We were fine back then and we would be fine without it. And we would be happy. I believe that. We would be happier in a world without email. We would be happier in text. We would be happier. Yeah. To overcome, you must educate. Educate not only yourself, but educate anyone seeking to learn. We are all dead America. We can all learn something. To learn, we must challenge what we already understand. The way we do that is through conversation. Sometimes we have conversations with others. However, some of the best conversations happen with ourselves. Reach out and challenge yourself. Let's dive in and learn something right now. Today we are speaking with Sam George. Sam George is the author of I'll Get Back to You. Sam, could you please introduce yourself? Let people know just a little bit more about you, please. Well, thank you, Ed. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I must say I'm I, I, I was very excited to be on a podcast called Dead America <laughs> because I thought, <laughs> wow, how this guy's really got it. <laughs> but in any Thank case, you. I'll be talking about the death of uh, communications today. Not that, <laughs> that does affect America. Um, so uh, I started out in politics and that really was my career. Uh, I was a political consultant who focused on messaging not so much the details and not legislative like lobby, but the big picture. You know, how do you develop a message? And then I translated that into television and radio and worked on some big projects. I've been an advisor to Nancy Pelosi, was very key in electing her speaker. But the biggest project I work on is I legalize marijuana. If I, if there would be no legal marijuana without me. And that's the really, I was the architect of that whole movement. Uh, I was hired by George Soros and a couple other billionaires. And they said, how are we going to do this? And so we did the research and stuff. And then um, uh, we did a multi-state ballot measure campaign. And I knew that one, I needed a message that would deconstruct the existing paradigm. And that was the power and the authority of medicine it wasn't so much the patients, it was the medical brand. And the second thing is, as each states go, these are earned media. And basically, we deconstructed the narrative, and that paved the way for the final stage, which was uh, marijuana legalization. It's one of the, it's a huge industry. And, uh, you know, it was a very lucky day that I met George Soros and him to me, because they never thought about doing a national ballot campaign. Yeah, that's what what was the reasoning behind the push to legalize marijuana? Well, they were all billionaires with George Soros. The drug war was a failing. I mean, you know, uh, millions of people incarcerated, largely African-American and Latino. It wasn't like they were like, wow, we want to do we think people have the right to do drugs. It was the fallout of the drug war. And so. 
So, you know, we worked on two fronts, although one front got the most attention, which was the medical marijuana, but we also did a number of uh, ballot measures and really helped change the, you know, back then, this is talking about 2000, uh, uh, 1990, 1995, you know, they had commercials yeah. the government was running where people on drugs would drop in, you know, would go off of diving into a concrete pool. That's where we were at. And, uh, you know, it was seen as a criminal and moral wrong thing. And we and other people, but through these ballot measures and, you know, it was the medical model. People knew that the drug war was failing, but they wanted a different form of control. And that basically, it wasn't the fact of the empathy for patients, but rather the doctors, if the doctors are doing it, well, they didn't know what the doctors were kind of a scam. But, but you know, public opinion changes. Uh, and this is a great way, you know, with votes to transform. We saw each, each, each cycle, you know, it took over 15 years that, you know, we would say a change in more people. So, so that's what it was. So, yes, I mean, the idea was to end the drug war primarily. And the result is we really have ended a lot of the drug war. Um, drugs are no longer seen as a, you know, as at the possession level as a criminal thing. And, uh, um, you know, now we have legalized uh, pot, but even hard drugs are not seen as a, you know, criminal unless you're dealing it. So we really helped um, transform the debate. But I can tell you structurally, without that message of the medical and without the, the multi-state ballot measure, we would not have we would not have legal marijuana today. Absolutely not. Yeah, you know, I, I look back at prohibition and it's the same kind of cartwheel going on there. So I, I think we would have learned by that. Back in the founding of America, we all grew hemp to help <laughs> support the nation. Right. So, you know, yeah, all of that kind of gets pushed by the media and, you know, they they are the ones that set the narrative, per se. Yeah, during the 60s, so, 70s, you know, there was a lot more openness to uh, to this sort of stuff. But with Nixon afterwards, uh, it just became yes. anti-drugs, anti-drugs. You know, they ran commercials 24-7 with people jumping into a concrete uh, pool. So you can see the problem. Well, there's there's a lot of implications that come along with that, you know, property seizures and uh, right, the, right. These, these, these implications, they ruin lives. And yeah, we did work on some ballot measures. I, we didn't do a lot of them, but I, I worked on a ballot measure in Oregon that prohibited or greatly limited the government's ability uh, to, to, to seize assets and things of that of people who had just been accused of uh, yes. wrongdoing. So uh, many of those people who, who have those property, the property uh, taken never get it back, even if they're not guilty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I see that changing. You know, they're, yeah, they're no, it's actually all changing. It's all changing, at least in the area of drugs. You know, <laughs> not, not that a, takes years that that takes years. You know, we we have to let the process unfold. It, and it came down to the reframing, though, of something not a moral or legal, but the authority of medical. I was reading a philosopher named Michel Foucault at the time, and that's where I got the idea. Foucault said the power's not just in government, it's on all these other apparatuses. You know, he points out how schools are designed like prisons and stuff. And one of the things, birth of the clinic, which is the power of the medical institution. Well, I use that to my advantage, but it's still here today. Oh my God, if you want to legitimate your brand, I have a yoga company, you know what it is? It's, it's a medical oh. yoga company. <laughs> huh. Yeah, really. And it's great, great uh, credibility, and and uh, you know what doctors say really matters. Although increasingly, I don't know they're even being challenged. But uh, but but then I got into after a while, I just got burning out. Um, I, I I ran for office and narrowly lost, and then I decided you know this is just not what I want to do, and um, uh, I formed a medical yoga company. And uh, later, I uh, formed a couple of nonprofit organizations. 
Um, one seeks to change the electoral college because currently we don't directly elect the president. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, Joe Biden won by seven million votes, but the difference in the electoral college, the final say, was only 47,000 votes. And that's why Trump challenged it. You, you can overturn 47,000 votes, but you can't overturn seven million. Uh, he wasn't crazy. That, he was just, <laughs> that was in with Rick. Now, Sam, Sam, when we talk about the electoral college, there's a reason that was set up, and that's to protect the rural type people. Well, yeah, it, from, it was, uh, from yeah. these big cities where a lot of mass population is. Uh, right. What, what's the reason? How do we change? See, because I live in the rural area and I get ruled by people in the city and and sometimes that causes these clashes to happen. I'm not saying it's always bad because we we need some oversight out here in the rural districts also you know i'm not saying we should be lawless or anything like that but i think that we should have uh a different oversight per se to our districts so well, you know when, i mean essentially i was just going to tell you my first book was just about this my first book and huh? i was it was called The Great Divide. This is in 2004. Yes. The Great Divide Metro versus Retro America, talking about the Great Divide. And it is rural and urban, but now it's become even more complex because, you know, the divide, you know, many of these states, even if they're urban states, have divides between the rural and the urban. And, uh, you know, some of these issues are really not the federal, uh, but have to be handled at the state level. For example, what state do you live in? I live in Oregon. Okay, well, Oregon, you know, Portland. <laughs> <laughs> Portland I live in Klamath Canada. County, That's Oregon. Much, they, you know, Portland and uh, Salem, pretty much the two cities, they dominate, That's right? That's right. And, and, and yes. you know, this is an advantage, but, it, but they make decisions that affect the, you know, there's, but the actual electoral college, you're right, it was, the issue did get back to red and blue states. It does go back to that. But the issue was in terms of the states with slaves, which are largely more rural because of the, the, what happened is they, they had a lot of African-American slaves. So for Congress, the vote was set up. So each person, they would get allocated three fifths of a vote, okay? For the African Americans, yeah. in terms of their, they were given an, an you know an, equal, an equalizing right. power, but with the with the vote you can't do that. So why we have an electoral college ultimately has to do with what you say, but more precisely with slavery. So um, you know there was no way of equalizing the the rural urban thing, and they did that in Congress by allocating uh, by population based on. Um, regular people, including slaves. Yes. What well, What is your thought on rank style voting? You know, I'm against anything but one person, one vote. I think that's what America's founded on. And this is what I'm trying to work very hard. Um, you know, I don't, you know, I, you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm in a, I disagree with that as much as I disagree with the current system um, that benefits Republicans tremendously. Here's the situation. Donald Trump in 2016 lost by 3 million votes and he became president. George Bush in 2000 lost by a half million votes and he became president. And Joe Biden won by 7 million votes. And the margin between Biden and Trump was only 47,000 votes in the Electoral College. It's a, it's a scam. You know what I mean? And it favors some people over other people. It favors white people over black and Hispanic people. It, it favors Republicans over Democrats. And so, you know, well, I, I'm sympathetic, you know. So anyways, that's enough about the politics. So I got into digital communication to, to, to raise money. You know, I had to, I got some grant money to get these organizations started and, and I had to fund them. And donations, it's hard. Donors are not a regular stream. So 
um, I learned the ropes. I had done a lot of work in digital advocacy, but, but I did done about 10 years where you try and get people <clears throat> and created a number like a university to get their alumni, to send emails, that kind of stuff to their congressman, whatever. But then I learned the ropes. Uh, I hired someone, a consultant, to help me with this fundraising. Within a few months, it was pretty easy to figure out. And so uh, <clears throat> I became a digital marketing expert. And then I also used my digital marketing in my yoga. But I'm very successful at it. And that's where I got to understand the digital landscape and uh, you know better. And so that gave me a context in writing this book. What the book is about is a simple experience. That's at the heart of the book. It's much bigger than that, is when someone returns our, doesn't return our message, um, it kind of goes like this. Someone doesn't return our message. It doesn't matter if they're a friend or whatever, you know. Uh, the first stage is, you know, after a while you get anxious, maybe age, agitated, anxiety about it, you're thinking about it. The next stage is, you decide something's wrong. Now, never mind the fact <laughs> that nothing is ever wrong. I mean, it's just like when some, you know, you, you've you gone through this before, you've had these ideas, and the first thing you catch up with them, there was nothing wrong. But no, still, you decide something's wrong. And here's the dangerous thing. In 70% of the people, all the things have pulled, you know, these, these, these three, this, these characteristics apply to them on a regular basis, probably universally, but these... 70% say they jump to a worst case scenario. In other words, they're not just going negative. They're going all the way negative. <laughs> yeah. And there's a yeah. reason for that. We'll talk about that. there's a reason. And then from there, it's catastrophizing and can't get it out of your head. You know, it's like a negative loop. You know, you know, you, you know, you know, four or five hours later, it keeps on buzzing back, you know, like, fuck him. Yes. You know? And here's the craziest thing. We imagine our wife at a conference might be sleeping with another man. All this distrust. Yeah. I mean, real yeah. shit. Or even worse, the stuff we can con. Exactly. All right. Delusional. And that's because when you start out with a delusional premise, the worst case scenario, you're going to have it's, it's delusional thinking. And if you look back and, you know, this happens to people with regularity because so many emails and texts. Emails and text are broken loops of communication. They are not communication. Emails and text are discommunication. And, and that is actually your website, discommunication.com. Fascinating. Well, you, yeah. Go ahead. It, it, it is fascinating what you've come up with here because – Nobody talks about this, how you actually feel when you get an email and you take the time and you get right on it and you get right back to the person. But sometimes you'll wait hours and days and that's not a good feeling because like you just stated, uh, not a the good worst feeling. always, it's, a terror. it's, a, it's, it's a terror. always the worst. Why, why is that? Why is that? Okay, that well, our gonna, mind okay, goes to the worst. Thing. Usually, I go into the communication thing. I, there's a okay. So, why is it that? Uh, and this is typical. Like when people are late. Oh, what does the brain fill in? Oh, the brain fills in. They were in an accident. Okay. Here, the brain fills in, and you know it's a worst case scenario. So, why does the brain fill in these worst case scenarios? If you haven't heard back from your boss, you texted him two days, you must be getting fired. So, why does the mind fill in the blanks, not just with negativity, but the worst possible delusional thing? And the reason why it has to do is with the way that the brain works. It's not fear that causes us to do this. It's not anything, self-esteem, all that, forget that, all those books, be gone. It's just simply the way, you know, whether you're confident or unconfident, whether you're secure or insecure, this experience will happen to you because the mind thinks in patterns. And if it cannot complete a pattern, it will impel you to do so. So, for example, back with the call. I could have had three positive reasons of why they didn't return the message. And I could have had three really negative reasons. But the reason why I went to the worst case scenario 
is it terminates. It provides a loop, right? Only worst scenarios are, are final endings, therefore completing the pattern. Any other scenarios, we don't know, right? But with a worst case scenario, you do. So that satiates the brain and said, but actually it has to do, I worked with a psychiatrist who helped me uh, process this, you know, and uh, he was the founder of bi the Biological Psychiatry Institute, which looks at neuroscience and the brain. But yes, when we don't know, we fill in the blanks. And typically we fill in the blanks with the most absurd worst case scenario, whether it be a phone call or whether it be an email or a text, whatever it is. And that's because all the brain wants to do is it has a, this uncertain, it wants to just complete the pattern and only a worst case scenario will satisfy the brain. Is that why some of these tweets bug us too? Well, I think you any, know, because any, they're any, short and anything where there's an indeterminate communication, right? So emails and texts, which is any kind of digital, it's what we're doing. And here's the communication theory. This is the big ship. This is the paradigm in which this sits. So up until about 1990, the only form of human communication, I'm talking about radio and stuff like that. The only form of communication to about 1990 was direct communication by phone or person or other medium, where there was a real time exchange like this. You could clarify things if they were not uncertain. You could broaden the depths of God as where you could go. Yeah. Um, you know, you felt uh, some connection typically. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's by phone or by person. This was the model actually before our civilization, two, two, two generations, two ancestral generations. Talk is what made that's it's not homo sapien, it's homo talker. I mean, our civilization was created on discourse. <laughs> and yeah. uh, can you imagine 1990? The complete, this is the biggest revolution in communication. Human, you had the printing press, but that wasn't about communication between you and I, right? In terms of what we call conversation. Yeah. And what happens is it just created an infinite number of situations where the mind has to fill in the blanks, okay? Yeah. Because you never get cool. a direct immediate response. And so what happens is, is just an infinite number of these uh, worst case scenarios, negativity, and it, it, you know, whatever the positive sides, I mean, everybody, I'm not here, there's always yin and yang, I'm here to talk about the yang. Uh, arguably, we would have been, we would, we would be happier without emails and text. They have, they have caused us so much anxiety, they cause us uh, so much stress. Um, they have narrowed our ability to communicate. I mean, I mean, if this is like, Oh my God! It, it, right now, we've it would have taken a thousand texts, and thousands to have this conversation. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. This is direct conversation is an ocean compared to a tiny, tiny puddle. That's what an email can communicate. There's creativity. You enjoy yourself. Frequent. Here's another thing: is that the brain releases dopamine. I mean. You already have people, I mean, you always hear about people, you very rarely somebody say, I had bad conversation, a good conversation. That, and people like, uh, you know, have a good conversation, the dopamine gets going. And people like later, they talk to like, what's up here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because the dopamine is yeah. pumped up to it. The key thing is you feel heard and you know, at the end of the conversation, would you agree or you disagree? There's closure. And you know you're that's strong, right. and that's security. So we went to that as the anchor to this pinball machine, okay? Ding, ding, ding. I mean, it really, it, it's insane. I don't know if they still have pinball machines, but, you know, I mean, it, yeah. they're, they're, by definition, they're broken. I can just tell you that emails and texts are not, if you talk about human conversation, and we talk about human communication or conversation, by all the dictionaries, including from Oxford and Merriam, they're not conversations. They are not. They are not an exchange um, in real time. And, and that's only that's the only form of conversation that currently is available. 
even after since 1990, Oxford and these dictionaries haven't changed it to include email um, and text because Interesting. it's not a real time communication. It's not a reciprocal. And, you know, it's so funny because people they do kind of point to why, well, you know, there's too many messages. This is this, and this and that. But they're not really clear. It's kind of like you say, you know, they they, they know there's some. Well, the bottom line is that a lot a lot of times people talk about the technology. It's nothing to do with the technology, at least on the user's end. Eighty percent of the people yeah. open up their emails on their phones, and one hundred percent of the people open up their texts. Same technology, telephone. Okay, so on the user's end, nothing's changed. Hmm. What's changed is this this. A, we don't have this direct connection and is people don't get it because it's an abstract concept. Yeah. Conversations are what changes lives. You know, I, I say that all the time. Conversation is my key focus. If, if you cannot communicate effectively, you're not going to change at all. And our life is all about change. We, we need well I mean that's the change. other thing you know that that's the bigger problem is that um one there's the miscommunication problem but what I see is the bigger problem is just what you say conversation and in human interaction because human interaction is just not an exchange of ideas people grow through conversations that's right they develop through conversations we learn through yes. conversations we can't do that through emails and text okay when's the last time you had an illumination through emails and text about yourself so yeah, <laughs> yeah. they're a key wellness thing and that's the danger that now i mean people don't want to talk on the telephone let oh they'll do everything to avoid it um they don't want to meet in person and that's the danger is that that's the piece that's yes. the most dangerous thing of all that we lose that that i mean i never hear people say oh we talked for hours <laughs> i never heard that anymore connection. we talked all night i mean no i mean yeah i mean yeah, like even connection. conversations are short conversations <laughs> yes and you're so right. You know, we we feed off of that connection through conversation. Absolutely. And, you know, Absolutely. I remember. Do you remember writing letters and sending correspondence out and waiting for mm -hmm. a reply? That is such a different uh, feeling inside and how we arrange it in our head. We're anticipating with a more gleeful feeling waiting for that letter that we're we know we're going to get we're disappointed when we don't get that letter so what's the yeah, difference oh yeah, there that, the big difference is that a letter is not a conversation right no one would say that yeah. made a conversation okay a conversation is a real time uh you know back and forth communication sometimes texting sometimes achieves temporarily uh, a level of uh, of a conversational tone and then all of a sudden somebody disappears <laughs> you know so so there's no real time uh, communication um do you remember the cuban missile crisis yes um, well okay. so i i know I, I, i'm not sure that everybody remembers you know, now we have putin and ukraine and now we're we're right. getting when 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 i grew up or actually my parents in the early 60s the United States were on the brink of nuclear war. They were 50-50 adversaries going at it, taking over countries. And what happened is the United States, there was a Cuban dictator named Castro. He was a communist in Cuba. Oh, we didn't like communists in Cuba. You know, we thought communism was the end of the world. So what did we do? We went and invaded him. And you know what? It was a disaster. OK, but the we Bay started this, OK, we started this right. The Bay of Pigs. Right. So then what happens is Castro cohorts with the Russians. And now all of a sudden there are nuclear missiles in Cuba. Can you imagine yeah. if China put nuclear missiles in Cuba? The yeah. problem is this whole situation between Khrushchev, he was the Putin back then, and John Kennedy, the president, was all done through 
telegrams, which are text messages. They're just like text messages. Incomplete. I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, right. There was no phone calls. You know what I mean? It, 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 and uh. in that, oh my gosh, what could have been settled fairly quickly, we it's the closest that we've ever been in nuclear war. And the reason why was all this paranoia and misunderstanding we talk about now with texts and emails. And you know what they did after that? Yeah. They, they instituted a hotline, a, a direct communication. Uh, yeah. Uh, to to um, actually, you know, the, the Johnny uh, Robert Kennedy, who was the Attorney General Johns, went to the Russian ambassador, camped out for seven hours, and talked to him. And they just cut a deal right there in the spot. Boom. Okay, we're going to pull out some of our missiles in Europe, Eastern Europe, and you get these things out of here. Done. That could have been done yeah. from the beginning, <laughs> you know. But the fact that there was this discommunication, and if that shows you how dangerous, and that's that's the kind of danger, that's the epic we live in. Um, and you know what? I don't know, but uh, you know, I, I just uh, I just have to tell you. So, you know, in my book, though, I do give some prescriptions. Remember, the heart of the book yes. was, was about okay, you know, like the centerpiece was, you know, how do you, you know, get people to return your messages, get people to understand your messages, reply quickly. The quicker people reply, the closer and the better that they understand, the closer we are. Now, it doesn't emulate this, but hey, we got to do the best we can. And some basic things, there are some basic things I tell people. Now, for, I have two chapters, so it's much more complex. What I did, as I mentioned to you, I'm a digital fundraiser. This is how partly how I make my living now. So I'm an expert. Like for example, I send out nine emails a week between my two different organizations and that I write and send out. And, um, and they're trying to sell yoga, get contributions for these causes and stuff. They go out, they're cold emails you know, to people. And um, one of the biggest things is the subject line. And when you said dead America, my next email is going to have a subject line, <laughs> dead America, right? Because what, what happens here, I'm going to use that a lot, because what happens here, you know, as a direct marketer, the only, it, it, this is all meaningless unless you get them to yes. open your email. And you, if you put sell the product, you know, no one's going to you know, buy me. You know, no, no one's going to yeah. open up the thing. And the same is true. The open rate, believe it or not, for, inter, for even among friends and colleagues is below 40%. So there's only a 40% chance that they'll ever open it, okay? So that's the first problem. Yeah. Uh, the second problem is, is that uh, people see it come across their screen. You know, we've got a pain of about 20 emails. Uh, we have less of a pain for text, you say about 10. You know, and, and then quickly, it recedes down. You know, you say to yourself, oh, yeah, 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 I want to get back. But the re <laughs> if you say something like medium or meeting or some lunch or some predictable thing where they think that they know what it's about, if it doesn't intrigue them, that's right. They're, they're going to file it. And, and that's actually file and forget. The two reasons are file and forget. Uh, well, very few people don't return intentionally. It's less than 10% that are trying to like just, you know, it's either due to uh, getting lost messages or file and forget. Okay, so how do you, how do you handle that? Well, um, the first thing you do is you've got to get them like with marketing to open the email on the spot. Like I told you, we use yeah. some, some really extreme things like, uh oh, your prescription has expired. You know, and then they open it up. Okay, <laughs> and they always they always donate. They don't go back to their email and donate. It either happens or doesn't happen. Okay, it's yeah. on the spot. They never revisit it, file it, and go back. Okay, so what that means is people complete. So if you can get okay, so what I say to you is obviously this is you don't want to be looking up crazy subject lines. So I just have a very simple process for for the general public which is very easy now uh, what is what is it just name a concept first idea that comes not related to this the first concept just the first idea that comes to your head or image 
uh, the mountains. Okay, put mountain or the mountains. I mean, that's fine. I guarantee you. The mountains. That, yeah, the mountains, anything. You put blue, yellow, whatever you, you know, just think of one or two words that basically it's like a pattern interrupt. They'll then see this. It will jump out to them mountains. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. rather than they won't, you know, it's less likely to get lost. And it's highly probable that they'll open the email. You know, we see these emails come in. The problem is we just don't want to deal with it. We think, you know, whatever, it's just blah, blah, blah. But if you put them in like the mountains, then you get them to open the email. The most important thing is to get them to open the emails. Because that wow to, factor. Yeah, it's a high, just, you know, we talked about that loop about how we yeah. want closure. For the same reason, Perfect sense. Yeah, they're likely to get back to you right there. You know what I'm saying? They're going to process yeah. it and deal with it, right? They want to complete the loop. Well, I'm I'm visual. I'm visualizing that as you're saying that. I'm going to me opening my emails, and I get many emails. So the first thing in the morning, that's the first thing I have to do is, and I'm checking them off for delete. You know, looking for that. <laughs> You difference. Know, obvious. Oh, I need that. Yes, I yeah, need something that. different. Oh. You know, man. So, so the key thing exactly is don't put a never put. I mean, there are some exceptions, but really not. Even in a corporate setting, you know, now these e email clients they group them, so it's not like you can say anything. It'll group your emails together. Your what Gmail calls is a conversation, right? So all the back yeah. and forth will remain glue, no matter what the. Uh, so don't, the last thing on earth you should ever do is put the subject in the subject line. Do not do that. Put huh. something different, something radically yeah. different, something, anything, but what the email is about. That's number one. Don't put what the email is about. Um, there are a couple exceptions, but it, not even really, because uh, almost always they're more likely to open it up. Even if you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, that wow factor. And you know what? Very, people, very in people will never say to you, why did you put mountains in the email? <laughs> I got too much shit going on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they won't, exactly. They, won't, they don't care. You know, they, they get into the what email. What do you mean mountains? Like, <laughs> <laughs> they don't care. No one's going to care. That's right. They get, people get so much shit, but they open the email. So how do you, yes. here's, the, here's the next biggest, this is this is the biggest problem. Uh not so much, it's a problem in terms of return message, but it's just an overall problem with miscommunication or discommunication. People scan the emails. Everybody scans yes. the emails. Oh my God. I tell, listen, I don't put more than one point in an email to somebody, <laughs> but I'll explain that to you. I, like I said, this is just the thumbnails of two chapters of strategy. So the second thing is how do you get them to read the email? Well, it's very simple. You start out, dear Ed, at the point of action, you say, Ed, comma, action. And then three, thanks, Ed, Sam. <laughs> That's it. Your name, yeah. you know, it, it, it's the oldest thing. Uh, there's nothing. They've hooked people up at all kinds. There's nothing, I mean, that people respond to more than their first name. And if you ever, have, you know, you know, a friend, you've known them for years, a friend of a friend, and you're at a party and you're talking to them and you get this uneasy feeling that, huh, did they, I think they forgot my name. Does that ever yeah, happen? Yeah. How do you feel? Yeah. Uh, I, I overlook it anymore, but I, I kind of reminisce to thinking, wow, that kind of sucks. Yeah. I mean, recognizable. you know. It, it, as we get older, but, but okay. If, let's say you go to a grocery store. The typical response is not a positive one uh, that, you know, like you said, that, that can vary, but it's not a positive feeling. Um, but if someone right. you don't know very well, like a grocery clerk, you haven't seen her in two months. says that waters. <laughs> I, you feel good, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you feel, exactly. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so we respond. It's as simple. Every salesman knows this, but it actually is based in neuroscience and way our brain works. So people respond. A lot of people do not start out their emails with dear Ed or just Ed, comma, right. They don't put a salutation on it. Almost nobody does it on text, but 
you that wow. you should do it there with text. Oh yeah, because the name wow. is presumed, right? People are they they got your name, right? There's so the, it's on the phone that's call. That's foreign phone. to me. You know, that's foreign to me. You know, uh, names are so important. Well, then you understand this principle, but go look at your text to you and see how many times people have put your name. Yeah. Dear Ed, you know what I mean? It's presumed because it's in the contact. It's right there. You're looking at their name, you know? So people, in other words, yeah. if I get a text message, you, it says from Ed, you know? <laughs> so, so the last thing on earth, so, so, so you want to use their name um, at least three times in an email. And I think the simplest formula is at the beginning, at the point of uh, uh, action, and then at the end. Um, it's not like you have to compliment them. It's not that. It's a different kind of validation. Yeah. It keeps them tuned. The second thing is, and this is very important, I get emails all the time, and you do too. And even when I open them up, I have no, I have no clue as to what they're getting at. I have, I don't even know sometimes what they're talking about. And many times I don't know what they want me to do. Right. You know, I, it's not asking for a response, you know what I mean? And if it's asking for me to do something, it's very vague, you know, what do you, what's your, what do you think? Or something like that. So the most important thing is to obviously make it succinct your email. Uh, the main body should be a paragraph. And in that paragraph, you should ask a question. You must always ask a question, no matter what you're doing, you reframe and put in the centerpiece a question because question means they have to respond. It also crystallizes the meaning. You know what I mean? If I say blah, 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 but then I say, how do you, and I can say, well, you know, gay marriage is good, we're big gay marriage is bad, blah, 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 blah. If I say, do you support gay marriage? Yes or no? <laughs> It, it crystallizes the point. You see what I'm saying? And, and you should put things, now you don't want to be that blunt about yes, no, but you should also, it's not enough to just ask a question. You know, you should, you should try and frame it in an either or sort of solution, okay? So rather than somebody sending something that you've edited and say, here are my ID, here's my edit, what do you think? You say, here's my edit, do you agree or disagree? <laughs> You'll get them, you know, this is how you get a response. Things become more focused. So the question is central to, to an email or text. You must ask a question to get a response. If you don't ask a question, why would anybody respond? This happens a lot with text messages with people. Hey, dude, hey, Powerful. how are you doing? You know, yeah. great, great, great. You know, uh, you know, a typical situation. We'll use a woman, okay, or a guy, a guy right? A woman and a guy going to going to date and and uh, uh, on a date, and uh, you know, the, let's say that we'll use the sexist version. So basically, let's say that uh, the uh, you know the, the woman says at, at you know ten o'clock. I said, "Thank you so much. I had a great dinner." You know, oh, by three o'clock, she's flipping out. She's decided that this is not gonna work out, you know what I mean? Because even though she didn't ask for a response, she, her brain wants a response, you see? So, yeah. you know, this is the real problem with text not being responded is that people just say, be bullshit. And so I tell people, yeah. text, be very deliberate in these texts. Do not send random texts, um, otherwise it will cause you pain. And one of the key things about text conversations is be very clear when you hang up. A lot of uh, anxiety is around, you're not sure. All of a sudden you're in the middle, midstream of, you know, it's kind of like a conversation. All of a sudden, boom, the other person's gone. Is it something I said? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I do something. Well, context. Yeah. You know, I, I'm guilty of this. Context for me, sometimes I lack giving contextual value to my text and actually this important. moose leader this leadership sign came out of the same sort of thing i gave no contextual value to a statement that i made and well, it left the person's guy. mind you have you think abstractly Ed, okay you, you you're you, you know you're you think it you have a theoretical mind you think abstractly i do at the back uh, my my wife is uh, Chinese, although she speaks English, and I constantly show, say, well, you know, I, I don't, I constantly forget to contextualize. And so, yes, you should, come, yeah. you should address 
But like I said, in contextualizing, that's where a question is so important to quickly get in a, yeah. it forces you to, yeah. to contextualize, right? It's even in a text message, let's say the scenario of the of the date. So the, the woman sends a text message at, at 10 o'clock, says, hey, thank you so much. You know, the pasta was really good. Um, do you think it's handmade? You see something like that, at least you've asked a question, your probability of getting a response yeah is much higher. So you can always ask a question and it doesn't matter how innocuous or frivolous the question is, always ask a question is what I'm saying. You know, with emails- yeah, I like that. Yeah, with emails, it's very, you know, emails are more of a, they're more of a composition, right? Texts are more of a, a statement, you know, like a chat. Um, with you design an email, you're composing it. People don't typically come- yeah. You know, they, so with the, you can easily construct a question into the, but let me tell you, we're always thinking about these emails and texts. you know, it's always in the back of our minds, even when we don't have one of those episodes where we go into the syndrome, uh, we still are stressed. They understand what I meant. That's a big thing. You know, will they get what I was trying to say? Did I offend? This stuff's going on in the background all the time. This didn't used to happen. Yeah. We created this. And then there's one last thing is within 24 hours, always follow up. My polling shows that 70% of the people uh, welcome, welcome the follow up. And, but people are kind of squeamish about that. They feel oh, even man. on a cold, even on a cold email. Oh, cold emails. We send, we send, listen, we send one every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. No, I'm talking about okay. with, with your people, with your colleagues, with your friends, with people. Okay. Okay. Good enough. All, these th everything that I've talked to you about is about regular email. Connection. You know I mean? yes. There are tactics that, you know, that I'm translating into to everyday life. So instead of asking some, you know, like explosive uh, dead uh, subject line, you say, just say mountains, you know, trying to make it real simple. Yeah. You know, just always address the person by their first name. Use it in the middle when you're you're asking them the question, and then uh, close with it. Thanks, you know, say thanks, Paul, whatever. You know, it doesn't you don't have to compliment them. You know, just use their name three times. This will keep them tuned in. I guarantee it. And then you know, always follow up. You know, beside you know, always follow. Up. This is a big mistake people make. They'll go on for days, weeks. You know what I mean? hitting themselves up, going through the psychological, you know, because it forms a negative loop that's catastrophizing. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's a miniature form of ghosting, right? So, so you know, temporarily you're in a ghosting mode. So, you know, someone has denied you, you know, rejected you. So what I tell people is very simple. Edit, copy, paste, send the exact same email, put a different subject line like rivers, okay, and send it off. Do that twice. Huh. Okay? Exact really? same. It's because they haven't, like I said, we've just said that the, I know from the data, the reason why people don't respond or they respond late to emails is either they lose them or they didn't read them. Okay. So sending another email, there's no need to rewrite it. They never read it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? So, so you just send them the same email. You don't want to put them on the spot. You know, one of the reasons people are squeamish, they want to, put, uh, you know, oh, you know, if I send them another email, they'll think I'm needy. Da, 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 da. No, they didn't see it. So you don't have to worry about that. What you don't want to do is forward them the email and say, hey, did you you miss this? Or, you know, that kind of thing. Because that does put them on the spot. Um, you know, and it, so you just hmm. send the same email as if, don't reference the previous one, as if you never sent the same as true text messages. That's it. That's fascinating. Uh, and all of this is outlined in your book? Oh, much more so. I've got all kinds of things. Don't put attachments. Don't put oh, links. Uh, you know I don't I mean? doubt it. It's Yeah, good, I mean, you know, it goes on and on and on. You know, be, be very, uh, like, one of the things is what you say is when you're in text, be very specific. Be detailed, not broad. You know, provide, con you know, be very clear. The more, yeah. you know, you do not want to be vague in a text message. You want to be as empirical, as clear, as complex as possible. Ironically, you want to be more complex, not less complex. <laughs> I know it so, sounds 
so tell me, Sam, what what got you into this battle of disc communication, and why why pick this battle? Well, you know what? I had this background in digital communication. This experience has bothered me my whole life. And what's even bothered me most is that nobody, because what I talked to, oh, probably, I don't know. I did some interviews, professional interviews. I pulled, nobody, nobody has ever talked to me. And I don't believe that anybody has ever talked to you when you hear about this. Sure, you experienced, but the first time you thought about it as a thing, right? So, so. Yeah. This is this is a real, you know, this is a major source of discomfort. Um, you know, <laughs> it ranks right up there. We've pulled it with the with with uh, news in terms of the anxiety it calls persons on a daily basis. This whole setup, this whole digital setup, is just very very insecure. You know, we used to communicate like this. I'm not going to feel insecure, not clear when I leave this conversation. And, you know, it's also yeah. the reason why we have so many emails. We have so many emails because you can't, you constantly, like, like I said, this would be 10,000, this would be at least 7,000 emails. So, so to oh, provide yeah. context, you know, so this is the reason for all of it. You know, I, my experience is that there's no going back and that uh, eventually some things will change. One, I think that people, we are literate. We've never been taught how to talk. We've never been taught how to write an email, how to write a text. Nobody knows what the heck's going on. Uh, and we have no knowledge. We're just a bunch of idiots out there. We really have not. I mean, our dominant form of communication, we don't have any kind of education um, on how to do that. Uh, you know, it's just a state of, uh, you know, it's not dead America, but it's dead communication. <laughs> This yeah. is not communication. It does more harm than it good. You think it does good, you know, okay, I can still, you know, talk to my friend and, you know, in, in, in Tulsa. Well, I can think about my mom in Indiana and I have very positive, you know, I don't need to talk, text her, you know what I mean? I have very positive feelings, yeah. you know, comes into my mind. I stay engaged through my imagination. And, and you know, I mean, I, I just don't, there's nothing, uh, I, I don't, uh, I, there's been no evidence that it's, people are more productive. Oh my God, and an area that doesn't really apply to my book, but it shows the mass discommunication in other form. Try and get into a corporation or technical support. Oh my God, it's impossible. The first <laughs> thing you'll get, I mean, like, you will, okay, first to find help, okay, is a big problem. When you find help, you will get yes. a succession of Q and A's. Oh, then you ask for a chat person. Then you'll get a chat person and give you more q and It's almost impossible to get to somebody. That's a loop. <laughs> oh, it's one That master. is a loop. <laughs> I mean, you know, we spend hours, you know what I'm saying? And, yes. and, and, and yes. you know, and even chats, they're like text messages. You know, you can't really, they don't really emulate whenever I'm yeah. direct that, you know, it's very hard, you know. <laughs> To, to to chat yeah. back and forth about content. Emails simply cannot, if you're dealing with complex, like when I deal with the CRM, the company that deals, sends out my emails, it's very complex. When I try and explain something, it's very difficult to, to put this in an email. So we've lost touch there. And, you know, and that human context is very important too, because even though there's strangers, call someone at the bank and say, how can I help you? These kinds of things to be able to reach someone. I will tell you, unless it's a major institutions, many corporations and services will not allow you to talk to them. OK, they will not. Your only option is to send an email. Quite a few. OK, that's it. That's crazy. It's true. Wow. So, so this is the rule we live in. Um, I would say that with all that's going wrong in politics, this is a much greater threat. Because it, it, it causes such great stress, it 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 so badly impairs our our communication, and finally, our quality of life. <laughs> All these yeah. conversations we grow from happy laugh. You know what I'm saying? We laugh. You know, I mean, th yeah. this piece of human experience is disappearing, and that's the greatest. Yes. That's the greatest loss. And so I don't know. I, I my book has a partial explanation. I don't know what's what's after that. I, I don't know. I don't know. But but uh, you know, you know, it's hard to say, Sam. 
we we have a world that is kind of in this changing pattern right now and that's okay just, it's always in change you know the the great thing that's about, true the great thing about the process of reality is it always moves forward now the bad news is yeah. you can't go back we can't go back to the presidency the way it was with obama and kennedy and all that. after trump there's no going back and look at poor joe biden you know on the firing squad you know to, to illustrate what's going on <laughs> Yeah. I mean, when there's no back to the to the old presidents are presidents, you know, it's a, you, so things go forward. And so the idea is you have to adapt. And so as long you can still do this, like this is one way of adapting, right, is to try and make clear communication, quick communication, you know, quick to, to, to take that broken loop and to try and make it as direct as possible. But in terms of the human contact, I don't know. I, uh, somebody, a host said to me one time something kind of fascinating. He said to me, and he said to me, what would have happened if we started out with text? And all of a sudden, somebody came up with a <laughs> telephone. I thought to him, yeah. I think people would love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I think people will move to it in flocks. They go, oh my God, you can actually talk to each other. You know what I mean? That's the funny thing yeah. about life. So that's the process of reality and that's it. I can tell you interactive uh, in, uh, Zoom and stuff like this is not has proven to be a failure for two reasons. Um, you know, it, people don't like it. Um, it's alienating. Like right now I'm talking to you and I see a box. Um, one-on-one, -on -one, it's okay. But when you get into multiple people on a meeting, you're much better off with a conference call. So much distraction is glitch. Um, but here's the biggest reason. The last 10 years, we've been able to call our friends, you know, with our iPhones through FaceTime. Yeah. Nobody does it. Yeah. It's like Alexa. Who uses Alexa? Oh, play uh, Jim Morris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, people, that's, that's interesting too. Yeah. You know? I mean, I'm just trying to say, it's proven, and it, it, you know, it's a proven failure from a consumer point of view that somehow interactive can technology, because we've had it. Put aside yes. the corporate aspect, Zoom's mostly corporate. The interactive, okay, we've had it for, for over 10 years through our iPhones and they have similar things and we don't use it. So, what does that say? That says that interactive video is not going to be the response that, that, uh, that's not going to. That's not the next. That's not the next stage in this development. Um, it's been proven interesting. A, proven a failure. It, it it doesn't shoot as much dopamines in our brain apparently. Well, no, we just don't do it. What I'm trying to say is that FaceTime is fine. You know, I mean, just like this is fine. But the point is, is that people just don't use it. So when people say to me, "Well, do you think that you know real time video is going to replace this?" and you know, because Zoom is used a lot in business and formal things, but not a lot of people talk to their friends on Zoom. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> talk true. To a friend on Zoom and and even FaceTime is so a hassle. You have to schedule it and all this stuff, you know, but people can spontaneously yeah. they have this ability for 10 years or longer where they can call on their iPads or their computers or their iPhones instead of calling them in person or texting them. They can call them through FaceTime and have an immediate real-time conversation like this. That's fine. Yeah. My point to you is that no one has used it. So that shows- Let's start pushing people to use that communication The marketplace, is, it's, it's failed in the marketplace. You know what I mean? And, and so is all yeah. this, so is the audio thing. I mean, people don't talk to their stereos and stuff. I'm embarrassed to say here, <laughs> hey, you know, like I'm looking at my iPad, my wife's over there. Hey, Siri, I'm embarrassed to say that. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know, kind of. Oh, she's kind of different anyway. She just, hey, Siri, <laughs> you, I don't want to talk to you, Siri. So, so you see the problem <laughs> is that people are not talking to Siri. People are not using yeah. their stereos to say play Led Zeppelin. You know what I mean? The, the, it, 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 these are, pro I, I use the analogy because yeah. they've been proven failures in the marketplace although people will continue to promote them. But no, internet, so in other words, I, we can rule out because this, we have 10 years of reality. I can't rule out Zoom for businesses and stuff like that, but I can rule out for everyday life, for, for human exchange, we can rule FaceTime. That is real-time visual, we can rule it out. Yeah. We've had it for 10 years and never used it. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of see. So, I mean, in other words, saying. we have no place to go. I mean, yeah. maybe in the metaverse, <laughs> I would say that, oh, the metaverse has some possibilities. That's coming soon. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I would say that your best chance of having, I don't think it'll be on a mass level, but I, I think I, I have, I, I have a, a headset just because I want to explore it. I don't play games and, uh, Oh yeah, it's it's uh, you know your ability to sit down, you know, like with your son, watch a you know movie and interact, and you know you'll be able to develop icons of just like I I, I don't I'm not yeah. saying that this will replace <laughs> this this is not the answer yeah. the digital communication divide, but if anything has any promise in terms of raising the the level of communication, you know, and raising the level, not answering this question you know, it it really will raise the level of communication that's available to people. I don't think it will do it on a mass level, but I don't know. I don't know. The yeah. biggest question of this interview, Sam, what are we going to do if it all breaks and we have to go back to meeting face to face? If it all breaks? Yep. You know, that's no more a internet. You know, some hypothetical, <laughs> you know, I said earlier a hypothetical about what happens if we didn't have it. You know, ultimately with hypotheticals, they're just hypotheticals. You can't really yes. say one way or the other. I had on that particular one, all I can say is we figure it out. Okay. We figure it out because before the telephone, we did it. Okay. So we figured That's it right. out. Right. You know, so I like that response. Yeah. Since yeah. They, I don't know if the fellow, you know, like we would figure it out for, for, I believe the telephone. So up until 1900, we were fine. Okay, there's no reports of uh, yeah. you know mass suicide or anything. So in other words, for millions of years up until 1900, we were able to do that. Everything broke because there was nothing, you know. And yeah. that's that's about around that time, 1915, 20. The telephone was created. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we'd be fine. We were fine back then, and we would be fine without it. And we would be happy. I believe that. We would be happier in a world without email. We would be happier in text. We would be happier. Yeah. It's interesting what you've come up with. This is a fantastic topic to talk about. How can people find the book, Sam? Um, people can find it by going to my website, which is discommunication. Like, think about dysfunctional relationship. D-Y-S, discommunication.com, D-Y-S. Or if you want to find the summary on Amazon, just put, um, I'll get back to you, which is a common phrase of people. Hey, I'll get back to you. And just put George. Like, you were, do you remember, did you, in your general, Curious George? Do you remember Curious George? Yes. Yes, okay. I love him. Just put George in as in Curious George. See, I'm giving you things. So just put George yeah. as in Curious George. You put, I'll get back to you because people always say it and you'll find my book. Yeah. And the that's, Amazon that's great. So what is coming out next with Sam? Well, you know, I'll continue to work on this. I wrote a book about the Great Divide in, 19, in, in 2004 that it turned out to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, because it was just political back then. It wasn't a war, but we you know, named it Metro versus Retro America. You know, I'm eclectic. Uh, I'll come up with something different. Um, one of the things I'm working right now is the uh, is a philosophical concept called the, you know, so I'm working on a philosophical book because um, that's of interest to me. I, I am a philosopher. You can't tell an armchair philosopher. No, actually an academic philosopher. But uh, yeah, I'll be working on a philosophy book. But I have a very eclectic, you know, the idea is to bring into to view new ideas, new conceptions, just like I did with Pot. You know, like to make people think in new ways, to bring new ideas. And what my ability to theoretically, because of my training in philosophy, to really... And partly because I'm very abstract, I'm an abstract thinker. I can twist things and see relationships. I'm a I'm an extremely abstract thinker, so I can jump here and there. You know, people who are abstract thinkers, and I think you are one, can go up here and look down. Many many people don't have that function, and uh, so they can't. So that's what allows me to see this. <clears throat> 
I was writing a book on fear. That's how I got here, <clears throat> you know. And uh, uh, I, I thought that fear was just this, I thought it was bullshit that all fear was back to fight or flight. And then I proved that it's not, that a lot of our fear doesn't have to do with anything, but just the way our brains develop. And so I don't know, I'm writing a philosophy book for my own edification. Um, uh, it, uh, it combines philosophy and, 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 and Christianity. I, I think it will be of interest, but I'm, it's wow. not something. It's, it's, uh, it's, there is, there is one word that unifies all of existence. So I don't think it'll be on this context. There is one word that unifies all everything. And that word is L-O-G-O-S, logos. That is the foundation of everything. Both Christian, philosophical, throughout the tradition. Today we call logos like, you know, logos on my company. My, my company has a logo, like Apple has itself. But that's that's what it is. I mean, essentially, with one symbol, it explains it all. So this book is a, a, a book, and I, I, you know, I don't expect, uh, you know, but really for those that are interested in this stuff, it's a more work, it, it will give them a different understanding of, of how they look at philosophy and religion they will see that philosophy and religion are really the same thing. Interesting. I can't wait for that. You know, that that's kind of what we do here. We push what we think we already know. We, we never put people in boxes because we're already there. We've got to climb out of those boxes. Let people be who they are. And the world is always exciting. And like you just stated, Always try to push new thought, new experiences. I love and it. Here's the thing to remind too, is that, you know, we talk about, oh, American, these things are bad, blah, blah, blah. Every generation throughout history, I mean, this is in all the historians, without exception, would look back at the younger generation and say, like my generation, my kid was using, you know, iPhones and shit, you know, he, you know, it's like all they cared about playing games. I'm like, how in the world are these people going to, you know, what's yeah. going to happen? They don't even write. They yeah. can't even write. Well, these people now are running uh, our companies like Tesla and, <laughs> yeah. and that training yeah. through that. So, so what I'm trying to say is that re reality is dynamic. And so people are complaining about the That's millennials. That's a good point. Don't co you complain about the millennials. Believe me, they will bring new things and new ideas, and they will help. Reality, you know, I mean, it's, it's generally progressive. I mean, overall, have the good guys lost? <laughs> you know, no, I, I don't think I mean, anybody's overall, lost. I mean, there's a, there's a progressive tilt to history, okay? I, yeah. I mean, you know, we're not going back to, so there's a progressive tilt to things. So I always have faith. I always have faith. And even with the, you know, this yeah. digital, you know, thing, I always have faith that people will adapt, they will accommodate, and they will come up new ways. Maybe it is the metaverse in this particular issue. There are That's new ways, new ideas. I mean, the metaverse is very possible, a very, they can make the headsets not weigh three pounds, but, you know, they're yeah. working on it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, a yeah. trillion dollars. So I, I always believe in that there's, there's always hope. And uh, Dead well, America... Well, there's hope for dead the, Americans. The, uh, there's always hope. Never no, lose hope. I mean, hope. it will change. These changes are good changes. Yes. I mean, you know, Donald Trump brought a lot of bad changes, but he also brought some good changes. You know, he deconstructed yeah. politics. Right. <laughs> I, I see. I see that in every president we've had. You know, right. there's there's challenges that we have to face, and. Like you said, each generation will step up when it's time. Yes, and will grow. And so don't ever. It's That's like, right. you know, if you look back and say, uh, oh, you know, that's why people always say, well, a bad thing was a good thing. <laughs> Something bad happened. I lost my lottery ticket, but I met my wife and I lost a trillion dollars. But I love my wife. I love my kids. We live in a trailer. I am, you know, but I'm happy. I mean, Perception always just, fills I mean, in the gaps. Some could say that's a rationalization, and maybe it is. But the bottom line is that's how we process reality. You have to yeah. move forward. If you do not move forward, if you get stuck over some lady you broke up with, 
as long or some situation or past thing, you are stuck there. You are a prisoner of that moment unless you let go. And if you let go, you don't have to do anything because the process of reality or what in a macro scale history will move forward and it always is better. I don't think that anybody can say that the world is not better today than it was in 1940 or 1772. It's just That's more right. fucked. You know, it's better, but it's fucked up. <laughs> well, uh, excuse my language. Keep, but anyway, keep living the dream. <laughs> there is <laughs> the dead America always podcast. hope. <laughs> there is great hope and there's exciting possibilities always yes. around the corner. <laughs> so keep dreaming and live life to its fullest, no matter who. Well, yeah, I would, yeah, I keep dreams, but try and execute those dreams. You know what I mean? Yes. It's yes. the key thing is that. So what do we do, right? There's this change and you have to find new ways to adapt, right? New ways to take the values of the old and adapt them into the new. One way is my book. It's a, you know, we had the situation. Now, how do we get, okay, well, we can't do that. So here's some techniques and some technologies to try and better create more of a reciprocal communication. That's a small thing, but an important one. You know what I mean? And yes. uh, I believe that more education and more people will, you know, I'll continue to to make this case, you know, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, but there, you know, in terms of Russia, Ukraine, these things have happened throughout history. It's not the end of the world. That's right. You know what I mean? Oh. We thought, why do we do this? Because when we can't fill in the blanks, we go worst case scenario, right? So remember that. That's right. So, uh, so yeah. <laughs> That's right. You know, uh, you know uh, life will go on. People will adapt and we'll survive. That's right. And then, I, I don't know. We just, our life changes. New things come up. That's right. Sam, I want to say thank you very much for being thank part you. of the thank Dead America podcast. Thank you. You're man. I really, uh, really, it was really a pleasure. You're so thoughtful. And I, I, I think you've asked the right things. Thank you for being part of it. Thank you for joining us today. If you found this podcast enlightening, entertaining, educational in any way, please share, like, subscribe, and join us right back here next week for another great episode of Dead America Podcast. I'm Ed Waters, your host. Enjoy your afternoon, wherever you may be.